thanks very much for joining us and thanks so much for your patience. Uh, I know everyone was very excited to uh, kick off January um, last week with the economic crisis, but uh, we managed to fit it in this week instead. Um, this is the last in the series of a really great um, project that we ran as part of In Case of Emergency, this exhibition. And uh, tonight we're looking at the financial crisis, uh, which has been a regular feature since the Industrial Revolution. And aptly uh, being 10 years uh, after the economic crash in Ireland, um, we reflect and ask questions this evening like, could it happen again? And if so, would it be worse? Uh, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Peter Lunn. Uh, Pete Lunn uh, is an economist and former, C former BBC journalist and works for the ESRI, uh, who we collaborated with as part of the exhibition. Uh, I'd like to welcome Pete and give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, an apology. Um, this was supposed to be last Wednesday, and I was flat on my back with that horrible strain of flu, which I hope none of you have had the misfortune to encounter. Uh, I did. I was in no fit state to give a lecture, um, and I'm just about in a state to give a lecture now, I hope. Um, I hope what I can do for you is going to be reasonably interesting. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about pain and potatoes. I have no slides. Um, I'm a scientist. I use slides for most talks that I give. Um, but usually what I'm doing is I'm presenting experimental designs and data. And tonight I'm not going to do any of that. Tonight what I'm going to do is present an argument. And I'm of the view that PowerPoint slides are actually usually detrimental to presenting arguments. Uh, they reduce everything to a series of bullet points that all have apparently the same worth. Whereas some of the arguments I'm going to make tonight are probably pretty trivial. Some of the arguments I'm going to make tonight, I'm going to argue, are really rather important and are things that we should think about. And when I get to those, I really want to emphasize them, so I don't want them to be a bullet point on a slide. I want to ram them into your brain as hard as I possibly can. Okay, that's what I'm going to try and do. The other feature of tonight's lecture is this. It's going to be interactive. You are doing some of the work as well. Okay, that's going to happen. Everyone's starting to look very apprehensive. <laughs> Yes, you thought you were sitting listening to some, <laughs> some lectures of interesting things. Well, hopefully there will be some of that, but I also want you to play a part. We're going to do some experiments where I want you to shout out some things. I want to have some shows of hands. Uh, we're going to do that for a specific reason. The primary thesis I'm going to give you tonight is that the reason we have systematic financial crises is because we fail to understand and pay due respect to the systematic complexity of human psychology. I'm a great fan of elegant experiments that give insight into human nature and psychology, and I'm going to try and do a few of them with you guys tonight as a way of trying to persuade you of this. So we're going to do some of those. Hopefully that'll be a bit of fun along the way. But I'm also going to ask questions. I'm also going to invite answers. None of what I say is set in stone. I am up here presumably because I have some kind of claim to expertise. Let me tell you something. I do not understand global financial markets. I never have. I never will. What I do understand is that there's probably nobody on the planet who does, even though there are a lot of people who believe that they do. And that's going to be one of the key planks of the argument that I'm going to make. OK, so enough preliminaries. Let's get cracking. Um, let's do something interactive right from where we go. Here comes the potatoes. Right, imagine the following scenario. Imagine you're going for a canteen lunch at work. OK, and you're buying a baked potato. And you arrive at the till, and as you arrive at the till, you realize that you haven't been charged for the two little packets of butter that are hidden behind the baked potato. Okay? You realize the cashier hasn't noticed the two little packets of butter, 15 cents each for the packets of butter. Now, you decide not to say anything. Marks out of 10 for bad behavior, please. Where zero is nothing at all, and 10 is very, very bad behavior indeed. How many marks out of 10 for bad behavior? One, three, zero. this is good interaction. Again, good shout outs here. Anyone gonna go higher? The highest I've got so far is a three. Five. 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 Seven. Who's the seven? Where have I got, I, seven over. You think that's pretty bad behavior right there? 
yeah, yeah. You're, you're not alone. One of the things that's really interesting about this experiment is actually the variety of answers you get. You get a really strong spectrum. Okay. The point of this experiment is not the absolute number that you give. The point of this experiment is the following. Supposing instead you go for your lunch in a canteen and you come with your tray up to the cashier and as you're going up to the cashier you just push the butters behind the baked potato <laughs> in the hope you don't get charged for them. And sure enough, you don't. Now, marks out of 10 for bad behavior, please. I got a one, I got a nine. Okay, um, more numbers, more numbers. Seven. Five, seven, ten. Okay, I think I can, did I get a 10? <laughs> Whoa, okay. It's pretty clear that for the large majority of people, the second scenario gets a higher number than the first. How many people in the room think the two behaviors are equally good or bad? That there's no difference between them? I've got three up there. I've got another one there. Right, you may or may not know this. I've got six in total now, and that would be fairly typical, actually. Somewhere around 10 to 15% of the population, though they may not know it, are consequentialist philosophers. Right? And that includes you six or seven people. What that means is, what that means is that as far as you're concerned, what matters is the outcome. I mean, in both cases, you have made a decision. And that decision has determined whether you did or didn't get charged for the butter. And if all we care about is your agency in the world and the outcomes, then those behaviors are equally bad. And somewhere around 10 to 15% of the population, typically if you do experiments like this, think that those two scenarios are the same. And consequentialist philosophers will argue that they are. There is no right or wrong answer to this question, or at least somewhere in the region of 150 years of philosophy has not yet got us a right or wrong answer, because the consequentialists still argue with the non-consequentialists. And what I've given you is a kind of Irishized, everyday version involving a potato of a famous problem called the trolley problem in philosophy. The reason it's interesting to me as a behavioral economist who experiments on people, is that typically the overwhelming majority of people see a difference between the two things. That when the same harm is caused by inaction, it is less wrong, less worrying, than when the harm is caused by an action that involves an action and an intention. And the large majority of people believe that. Believe it or not, I think that rather elegant little demonstration of that, that little experiment, actually helps us understand causes of the financial crisis. And I'm going to come back to that later, and we're going to do more experiments that I also am going to argue tell us important psychological phenomena that are related to the financial crisis. So that gives you a flavor of what's to come. I have a question for you. <clears throat> Why do we experience pain? Why do human beings and animals suffer pain? Correct. Pain is a learning mechanism. It's absolutely essential. The reason people who have leprosy end up in the condition they end up in is precisely because that cycle is broken and they no longer experience the pain they need to avoid things that damage their tissue. Pain is an absolutely vital part of human and animal evolution. It's a learning mechanism. You experience pain. What that pain does is it teaches you what to avoid in the future. Right. Since the Industrial Revolution, there have been regular financial crises. Many of them have caused large amounts of pain. Right? The financial crisis that we had, the recession we had in this country that began almost 10 years ago, was actually the biggest recession in any developed country by most measures since the 1930s. It caused an enormous amount of pain to enormous amount of people. You can see that in the data. Right? And many, many financial and economic crises throughout history have caused pain. And yet, Unlike the pain we experience when we learn as little children not to go near things that are hot because they burn us, it seems that we are unable to learn what it is that causes this financial and economic pain because repeatedly, over and over again, we incur it, as we did this time. So it strikes me that maybe the reason for this is because unlike the little child who touches the hot plate, 
we don't know what's caused the pain. We can't avoid it because we don't know the cause. Now, I'm a scientist. I like to do empirics. So let's do some empirics. I'm going to guess that I've got an audience here that is substantially of above average intelligence and substantially of above average educational attainment. How many people in the room have a degree? I think that's almost everyone. Right. OK. So let's put it to the test. What caused the financial crisis in Ireland? Greed. 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 Corruption. Corruption. Sorry, we got a little bit. Someone said credit. Expand. Who said credit? Someone said credit. Up there. What do you mean? Uh, too much money being given to too many people. Too much money being given to too many people. Yeah. False trust. Give me that again. False trust. What do you mean? Okay, false trust, greed, credit. Give me other causes. Lack of regulation. Lack of regulation. I think that's extremely important and really, really good. Credit clearly is extremely important and really, really good. There was a massive credit bubble. Ireland had one of the biggest credit bubbles any developed country's ever had. There's one at the back, though. Failure of folk memory. You're anticipating what's coming later very well. <laughs> yes, I absolutely agree. I think... Um, Failure to learn lessons from history was an extremely important part of the crisis. Very Other causes? Behavior. What was the first one, sorry? The herd behaviour. You're also anticipating things that are coming. Yes, absolutely, herd behaviour. People copying each other. And in, I assume what you're referring to, I mean, quite often we copy each other very sensibly. If we see other people making decisions, often they're making good decisions, and if they know more than us, we should copy them. But often, herd behaviour or copying other people can propagate mistakes. So if people happen to believe that a two-bedroom apartment is worth, say, 450,000 euros on the Malahide Road, then maybe we'll all start to think that, and that mistake gets propagated. Politics was an interesting one. What do you mean? Well, I think there was a political climate where, say, a regulator who spoke out and spoke the truth would be in charge. Mm. Okay. Okay. I, I, right. So this is very interesting. Go back to my potato experiment. Right. One of the things my potato experiment tells you is that being a whistleblower or raising a red flag is a really difficult thing to do. Right. If you take an action that tries to change something and you get it wrong, you will be judged much more harshly than if you commit an inaction that has similar consequences. That's what the potato experiment tells you. And it's one of the things, and that's why it's got a deep psychological insight, it's one of the things that tells you about people speaking out. It definitely was true, and I think we know it was true, that there were people who had concerns and didn't voice them. It was certainly true in my institution, the SRI. I was in the SRI at the time of the crisis. There were people who afterwards wished they had spoken up more wished they had expressed concerns and doubts more. And I think there are a lot of those people, and it's difficult to speak up, because you will be judged for that action differently than if you don't speak up, even if it produces the same consequences. That's the potato experiment. It's a very good point. Other causes of the crisis? I, 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 agree, I agree with that, too. Yeah. I agree with that, too. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Yes, poor incentives in the financial sector is a really, really good answer. Yes. I think, I think we all have sort of responsibility because we, we kept voting for the party to continue as well. Right, and that's really interesting, isn't it? Because that kind of rubs against some of the other stuff. I mean, when people talk about greed and politics and certain you know, people who are taking risks and so on, quite often what's happening there is we're apportioning a degree of blame to a subset of society that's behaved in an extreme way. But the point you've just made is not about a subset of society behaving in an extreme way. It's actually about mainstream society taking a decision, collectively possibly, or as a group of individuals possibly, but either way you're pointing a degree of blame in a much broader sway of society by isolating that cause, and I agree with you. Yeah? Personal interest. Personal interest. Yeah. Hey, I, 
that's a very interesting point. I, I know of very, very few, if any, people who became richer as a result of financial crisis in Ireland, but there were definitely some in America. There were definitely some people who bet against the market and made an absolute damn fortune. But the, the international crisis had a different cause. Interestingly, no one's mentioned the international crisis yet as being a part cause for here, which clearly, to some extent, it was, although there was trouble brewing here anyway, I think. Yes, there's one at the back. More causes. Right, so the causes of the international crisis had knock-on effects. So here, I mean, the timing of the bubble bursting here is probably not a coincidence. Yeah, I think that's right. Although the crisis internationally had substantially separate causes, the one you've isolated is a good one. Yeah? Uh, the change from a manufacturing um, uh, industry base to a service industry base, that was the same. Yeah, I knew some stuff would come up that was controversial. I don't know whether that was a cause or not. I know the argument, and I can see why it might have some force. Other causes? That is a really, really good point. You hardly hear the expression of the Irish model anymore. But there was genuinely an international view among politicians and economists that Ireland was operating a different economic model that other people should copy. Absolutely right. And it turned out to be, uh, shall we say, a little mythical. Um, yeah. There was an underlying ideology of markets being self-correcting systems. Good. Good. Yes, there was. And, and the people who've looked into the crisis have identified that's a potential oh, cause. Yes, I agree. There's another one at the back. I'm extremely impressed. I absolutely agree with that. I think that's absolutely right. The euro was a cause of the, of the crisis. Part of the reason the euro was a cause of the crisis was the way it was set up meant that we ended up with interest rates that were entirely inappropriate for the growth that we had, and it fueled the credit bubble, and I absolutely agree with you. We're doing extremely well here. This is not necessarily going to help my thesis, but it might. Let's see how we go. Yeah. Yes, yes, there absolutely was. And it took real nerve to stay out of it. The longer that bubble went on, the bigger that bubble got, the more social pressure there was to do what everyone else was doing and to join that herd, the tougher it became to stay out of it. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. I agree. We're doing extremely well. I think we've probably isolated some in the region of 10 or 12 causes. We're still going, yes. Post-colonial need to own property. Post-colonial need to own property. So, <clears throat> I come across this all the time. You, you, you will have picked up by now from my accent, I'm English. Right. And <laughs> there is a view. I've been here a long time. I've been here since 2002, so I've got to the point now where some of my English friends think I sound like an Irish person, but no Irish person would ever think I sound like an Irish person. Right? Um, <laughs> And there is a view here that there is a particular, peculiar post-colonial love of property in Ireland that isn't the case in other countries. Um, the data would suggest not necessarily. Uh, it is true that property ownership is higher in Ireland than it is on average in other countries, but there are plenty of other countries actually that have home ownership rates that are as high as Ireland. I mean, Spain will be an example. There are, there are other examples. So this idea that we absolutely love property so much more than anyone else, more than average, yes, but it's not really peculiar. It's not really peculiar. I mean, there was undeniably a massive property bubble. Right. That's, absolutely, that's absolutely bang on. Yeah. How are we doing? We've got another cause. Lack of financial education. Lack of financial education. OK, so I don't think that there's any evidence. That, I mean, there's been surveys of financial education in Ireland. I don't think there's any evidence that Irish people are less financially educated no, than people I'm globally. But... Think about the Irish situation because I don't know exactly the cause. OK. OK, so I'm just going to digress momentarily on financial education, because there's one thing I think I've learned through more than a decade now of operating as a behavioural economist, and it's this. And it's a depressing thing if you come from a family. I come from a family who are educators. All my family are educators. All of them have been in the university system. All of them are great believers in education. Let me tell you something that's fascinating about financial education. It doesn't work. 
Right? All of the evidence suggests that giving people financial education doesn't improve their financial life outcomes. If you educate people at school, everyone thinks, oh, we should be teaching people this stuff at school. Where people have been exposed to financial education at school, they do no better financially than people who haven't. Um, where financial education programs have been introduced in workplaces and they measure the impact on financial performance later, the effects are tiny at best marginal, even if the courses are really intensive. So they've done this in the US military, for example, where people leaving the military might have a 10-week course on how to organize their personal finances. They still use their credit cards too much, they still get into trouble. There are even some financial scams that you are more likely to fall for if you are financially educated than if you're not. Right, so, yeah, it is very interesting, and if you, if, if you believe in education, it's largely depressing, right? But it tells you an awful lot about how finance works. The complexity of finance is such that even if you are highly financially educated, you still come a cropper. And there are great examples of this. Richard Thaler just won the Nobel Prize in Economics for Behavioral Economics, set up himself a fund based on behavioral principles because he thought he could make loads of money on US financial markets. His fund bombed. <laughs> right, he won the Nobel Prize. Okay. Any other causes? Yeah, we're still going. It's fantastic. Go. From a global perspective, you've got the base of regulation, Europe, and that provides mortgage obligations, special purpose vehicles, reckless lending, and uh, rental homes to loans. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. You're absolutely right. So, and the point I think you're largely making is the complexity of financial markets and financial instruments, that these things were so complex, people couldn't value them. And as a result, they were massively overvalued, and then we ended up with this huge credit crunch, and this was one of the causes of the international crisis. Excellent. True. Yeah, interest, rates, interest rates were particularly low. Yes, interest rates were too low, and that relates back to the euro point, the euro point earlier. One of the reasons was because we joined the euro, and interest rates were being set not for us, but for other people. Yeah. Hmm. I, okay. So I, I think there's clearly some truth on that, on the kind of planning and development side, and that was a contributor to the property bubble. I think that's probably absolutely right. Yep. Right at the back in the corner. I didn't catch the first part of that. Just say that again. Money is a myth that we buy into. Okay, that point may just be too deep and good for me, I think. <laughs> um, ultimately, despite everything I'm going to say, and despite the fact I'm a behavioral economist, I am an economist, I'm a great believer in money. Um, I think one of the reasons we live in a developed economy is precisely because money is such an amazingly effective promise, even though it blows up in our faces sometimes. Um, so I'm going to respectfully disagree with you and move on, if I may. But I, I do, I, I nevertheless think that the point you've made is, is a good one. I mean, uh, our... Genuine understanding of how money works and what it does and the degree to which we fetishize it, and all that, that's a really interesting area, and it could well be some kind of contributing factor. Yes? Uh, the principal agent problem. The principal agent problem. My God, we have got an educated audience. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, and are you talking about some specific part of the economy with that? Right. So you have misaligned incentives in which principles can't be controlled by the agents on behalf of whom they act. That's the principal agent problem for people who don't know the jargon. It means that you can't incentivize people's behavior so they act in everyone's interest because they're more likely to act in their own interest. And we can't, we can't do that. And you're arguing that occurred for politicians and for bankers. I think that, that's probably bang. I've got a couple more, maybe. One at the back. It's one of the reasons that the Irish actually really want to blame religion in the very now, you have, without a shadow of a doubt, produced something that I am not qualified to answer. I have no idea. Um, Sorry? Yeah, I mean, right, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to that, and I'm going to come back to it very shortly. I'm also now going to move on. Um, I am hugely impressed by the answers that have been produced here. Um, and in a way, I was taking an each way bet for the following reason. If you guys hadn't been able to produce causes, I would have argued that if I've got even an intelligent and interested audience, and they couldn't produce causes of the financial crisis, 
then clearly the messages hadn't been absorbed and we didn't understand those causes, so how were we ever going to respond to them? How were we ever going to be the child who learned not to touch the hot plate? But the fact that you were so good at it, I think, tells us something else. It tells us the incredible complexity of the causes of that crisis. Right? I think you've come up at this stage with 14 or 15. <coughs> right? I think you're missing some of the big ones. Right? As a group, there's some we haven't touched, and I'm going to mention them in a moment. Right? But you've done extremely well in terms of the full, pure volume of possible causes that you've generated. Some of them are definite causes, and we'd all agree. Some are probably more contentious, where some people would say, well, I don't think that played a part, and other people would say, well, maybe it did. But the complexity of that crisis was enormous. Now, I think there are certain things about government that didn't really get mentioned. At the time the crisis broke, we were running something close to a fiscal deficit, despite the fact we were towards the end of an absolutely massive boom. That meant the government had no money when the recession struck in order to try to counterbalance, as, tip, and it, as a good economist would tell you you should do. You save in the good times so you can spend in the bad times. We didn't have that. We had a tax base that was too narrow with the result that when the property crash happened, our tax revenues massively collapsed and we couldn't afford to pay our public servants. Right? That happened too. We also couldn't afford government spending that was absolutely essential to try and get us out of the crisis. Nobody mentioned the bank guarantee. We guaranteed all of the liabilities of the banks at a time when we were underestimating them somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 fold. Okay? We guaranteed the entire lot of them. Poor regulation was mentioned. There is absolutely no question the regulator was asleep at the switch. The regulator was, at the time, worrying about governance, provided the governance were arrangements in were in place, the right committees were in place, the right appointments were being done, that's what mattered. The regulator was not in a position to be second-guessing the bank's decisions. So if the banks took too much risk, that wasn't the regulator's problem, provided they were being properly governed. We trusted the banks to manage their risk. So all of these things were things that the government itself made as errors. And Although people mention politics, very few people mentioned big macro government policies like that as being an important contributor to the crisis. It was an important contributor to the crisis, including the government's own underestimation of the risk that had built up in the economy. Nobody, absolutely nobody, thought that the trouble was as big as it was. Okay? Uh, I'm going to come back to the issue of did Morgan Kelly and other people predict it in a moment. As for the banks, well... The banks had very low capital requirements. They could lend out an enormous amount of money and keep back only a small amount of it to cover immediate expenditures if they had them. Now, that's been changed. That was referred to up there now. It's been increased under the new Basel agreements, but not by very much. So the banks didn't have to be massively well capitalized. Incentives were mentioned. That's correct. They, they faced incentives that were not good, particularly people who were selling financial products like mortgages. They were being rewarded for how many they sold, not for whether they sold them to people who could pay it back. So there were incentive problems within the banks. Here's another thing that wasn't mentioned. The bank's expansion, and this is one of the reasons the regulator was asleep at the switch, was absolutely extraordinary. Historically, if banks grow their loan books at more than 6% a year, they've run into trouble. Across multiple international situations and multiple decades, banks that grow their loan books at more than 6% a year run into trouble. Every single one of the Irish banks in the early noughties, every single one of the six regulated banks was growing its loan book at more than 20% a year. Anglo-Irish was growing it at more than 40% a year. Right? Now, when I say the regulator was asleep at the switch, that lack of historical knowledge, noticing that, doing something about it, realizing the scale of the risks that were building up in the economy, that's what I'm talking about. The bank's own oversight of their own credit positions was extremely poor. They made terrible credit decisions and bankrupted themselves. Whatever incentives they faced, I think most bankers who were around at that time probably would take those decisions differently if they had them all over again. The executives of the banks didn't understand their own institutions. The complexity of the positions that the banks had taken up was such that their own executives and their own boards couldn't actually understand the level of risk that the bank faced, which is one of the reasons the oversight failed. We hardly mentioned developers. All these developers bankrupted themselves. Enormous numbers of developers paid far, far too much. There was a commercial property bubble as well as a housing crisis, and a load of developers went bankrupt. The construction sector had grown to be 14% of the economy, which is more than twice the size of the construction sector in most developed economies. 
We had a massive commercial property as well as residential property bubble. We also had some things that we discovered afterwards to be very important. Asset concentration. Wealthy Irish people disproportionately were invested in Irish property. So when the bubble burst and when everything went tits up, wealthy Irish people lost enormous amounts of money because they weren't properly diversified. Their investments were concentrated in the very assets that then went down the tubes. Right? So there was poor investment strategies. And unfortunately for all of us, unless you are one of these wealthy people, the truth of the matter is how well we get on and how safe our jobs are depend on the sensible or unsensible behavior of the wealthy people within our society. And if the wealthy people within our society make poor financial decisions and invest their money poorly so that all that money gets wasted away, we all suffer the consequences. And we did. I think we got the international causes. I think there's something else. Somebody mentioned ideology, and I think it's a really good point. I'm an economist. I think it's absolutely undeniable that the prevailing wisdom that markets work, if left alone, contributed to the crisis. And indeed, the official reports concede that. I go further than that. I mean, Alan Greenspan, who was arguably one of the architects of the crisis, because he was the chairman of the Federal Reserve at the time that the bubble really built up, both in America and internationally, he even confessed up to that afterwards. I mean, he said to a Senate committee afterwards that there was something fundamentally wrong in his understanding of the way the world worked, and he fessed up to that. Not all of them did. He did, and he was brave enough to do that. How I thought the world worked was wrong, is what he said. Um, and that ideology wasn't right. To give you an idea of this, and I think this really contributes to financial crises, there is an awful lot of hubris in what people understand or believe they understand. And I'll give you an example. This. Robert Lucas is a macroeconomist who won the Nobel Prize for models based on rational expectations. In 2003, he spoke to the American Economic Association and he said that in his view, macroeconomics had advanced so far that the central problem of depression prevention has been solved for all practical purposes. Right? That's an extremely clever man, extremely intelligent individual, suffering from appalling hubris, which only a few years later came to bear. And he's had, unfortunately for him, that quoted back at him just as I'm doing now, many, many times since. Right? We thought we understood the way stuff worked far, far better than we did. When you get to the end of all of this, if I combine the causes I've given you, causes you came up with that I didn't, we've got somewhere in the region of 24 different causes of the financial crisis in Ireland alone that we've mentioned here tonight. Okay? That is an incredible degree of complexity. If we want to understand why it is that we don't know not, how not to touch that hot plate, I'm going to argue that the primary reason that we don't know not to touch that hot plate is because that complexity is too much for us. We cannot understand it. And I'm going to go now to talk about some of the deeper psychological phenomena that, understand that, that underlie that lack of understanding. And I'm going to try and give you some evidence for it. And that allows me to come back to the point that was made about Morgan Kelly. I think it is true. So I'm going to give him a compliment before saying something about this. Um, I think it is true that Professor Morgan Kelly from UCD was the first person in Ireland to genuinely see the potential scale of the problem that we faced. Uh, he wrote a paper, I was actually one of the peer reviewers for it, um, right back in 2006, where he said, Irish house prices are going to fall by 40 to 60%. And almost none of the profession believed him, nobody in the government believed him, people came out and rubbished the report. He was almost bang on. In fact, if anything, he was slightly optimistic. In fact, Irish house prices fell 57% peak to trough as a result of the crisis. That makes us the proud possessors of the second biggest property bubble of all time. The world leader is Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, they had a property bubble where prices fell 70%. Okay, we're number two on the list, I'm afraid. Um, now, Morgan was right. Morgan saw that coming. He saw that in the data. Uh, he did it by doing an analysis where he looked at house price rises of the size that we had had and pointed out that almost invariably they led to crashes of a proportion of that rise that would be somewhere in the region of 40 to 60 percent. It was a fairly straightforward, quite simple analysis that he produced. Since then, you hear many people say, well, Morgan Kelly predicted the crisis. Morgan Kelly didn't predict the crisis, and I can prove that actually. Um, in the following way. If you go back and look at that paper that he published in 2006, it contains the line 
Uh, the Irish banks appear to be adequately capitalised to withstand this fall. That comes as a huge surprise to most people because it's become common currency that Morgan was the person who predicted the crisis. Morgan predicted a massive house price crash, but even Morgan thought there wasn't a problem in the financial system. In order to understand the Irish crisis, we've come up with 24 causes. You have to put together, it's like a jigsaw. It's like Morgan had got two or three pieces of the jigsaw and could see part of it. Nobody could see how vulnerable the banks were. If you look back at what was written at the time, nobody anywhere that I can find, and I've gone and looked, nobody wrote at the time that the Irish banking sector was as vulnerable as it turned out to be. And indeed, even when we realised that the banks were bust and that we were really, really deeply in it, even then, our estimates massively lowballed the extent of losses and continued to do so for three or four years. Now, in fairness to Morgan Kelly, not only was he the first person to see that house prices were going to bomb, he was also the first person who did actually see the scale of the problem in the banks. But he didn't see it before it happened. He was just the first person to start to really assess how big it was, because he'd become, by that stage, I think, extremely interested. He's a very good economist and very sceptical of what officialdom was telling him, so he went looking for his own data, and the numbers started to go up, 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 up. What this tells you is that even the person who came closest to predicting the crisis got nowhere near its scale and severity. Incidentally, exactly the same is true of the international crisis. You will often hear economists say that there were some economists who predicted it. Right? Whenever I hear that, I say, please tell me the paper they predicted it in or the piece of writing that I can go and look up from the date they predicted it and I can compare that with what happened. Right? And often the name that they will come up with is a famous American economist who goes by the name of Nouriel Roubini. Nouriel Roubini gave a famous seminar to the International Monetary Fund where he saw the subprime crisis. He saw the problem of the collateralized debt obligations and the way it ricocheted into the insurance sector. He realized there was financial trouble in the US economy as a result of subprime mortgages and the way they were being packaged and traded. He was probably the first economist to really see it. And he wrote, raised the red flag at the IMF sem seminar. I think it was 2005, but I might have that wrong. It might have been 2006. Anyway, so it becomes this thing. Oh, Nouriel predicted it. I went and got the transcript. What Nouriel actually said was, there is a problem in the financial markets. Subprime mortgages have been mispriced. They've been repackaged and resold for too much money. This is going to cause a problem in the US financial sector. It is going to cause a recession. In the very same seminar, he said, I don't think this recession will be so deep that it will have international consequences. Right? Nobody predicted it. Lots of people say that there are people who predicted it. It has become common currency that there are people who have predicted it. I've looked for people who really genuinely predicted it, and you can't find them. And the reason you can't find them is because of how complex it is. In order to understand the Irish crisis, you have to put together those pieces of the jigsaw that Morgan Kelly put together. You have to put together pieces of the jigsaw in the banks. You then have to add in the pieces of the jigsaw. I gave you five aspects of government policy that also contributed to their inability to respond when actually the crisis hit. Unless you put all of those pieces together, you get nowhere near realizing the severity of what actually happened. And that's why nobody did, because that puzzle was too complex and too hard to see. You had to know too much, and nobody knew that much. And if I'm going to make one central point to you tonight, it's that. The reason we have financial crises throughout history is because the financial systems that are in place are too complex for any individual to understand, for any government to understand, for any bank executive to understand, and certainly for any pinstriped idiot on Bloomberg television who pretends they understand it to understand. Right? That is the kind of financial system that we have put in place. And if I make one central point to you, it is that. Now, let's have a little bit more fun. That's all a bit serious and negative. <laughs> financial crises are going to happen again, mark my words. Why? Because we don't know how not to touch the hot plate. Because the hot plate is too complex and difficult. Ooh, that's an interesting debate that I don't have time to go into, but yeah, maybe so. Here's an interesting thing. I think the extent of hubris makes it worse. 
I think if you don't respect the degree to which you don't understand, you have a problem. Let me tell you about an experiment that I really like. Um, I particularly like it because I like the name of the effect. There's some psychologists, this was published in a journal called Cognition, for any psychologists here, they'd know that journal. Absolutely brilliant system, right? What they did, I love this experiment, was they designed gizmos. Right? They had machines in a lab, right, that produced, and they had inputs and they had outputs. Things spat out the other end. And they had experimental participants who came in, and their job was to predict the output. So they got to watch the machine, and they could see how much the machine spat out. It might spit out balls or marks on a piece of paper. And they had to try and predict what these machines were going to do. Like, these looked like kind of wacky contraptions that they, these experimenters had built, right? And you had to predict what the machine was going to do. And what they did was they had people making predictions, but they also measured how confident people were in their predictions. In other words, they measured how well people thought they could understand the machine they were looking at from watching its behavior. And here's what they found. What they found was that routinely, people overestimated their ability to predict the behavior of the machine. Right? So they kept seeing it, they kept thinking they knew what it was going to do next, when actually they didn't. Right? Some of these machines, their behavior actually was completely random. You couldn't predict it. But people thought they were predicting it. Right? But here's the really interesting thing. Some machines, people thought they could predict better than others. And the machines they thought they could predict better than others were actually the ones that were most complex and had most visible moving parts. <laughs> right? In other words, the more you could talk about it, the more you could say, oh, look, this bit connects to that bit, and I can see that this goes over here and that, the more you had to say about it, the more you thought you understood it. Now, I get in trouble if I say too much about my colleagues who work in macroeconomics. Right? There's an awful lot you can talk about in macroeconomics. And the expression that I love that these researchers came up with for this problem is called the illusion of explanatory depth. The more there is to talk about, the more you can see, the more that's visible, the more you think you understand something that you don't. And there are a very large number of people who will tell you they are experts in things like financial markets and international economics and macroeconomics who believe they understand those systems far, far better than they do. And we can take people into the lab and experimentally show you why they have a degree of overconfidence. Because they can talk about all these different little bits of components, and they can be very, very expert and knowledgeable in them. And what that means is they believe they can predict the behavior of those systems better than, in fact, they can. You don't have to take my word for that. There's empirical evidence for it. Um, there's empirical evidence that there are a group of ordinary people who don't have any expertise in economics who actually produce better economic forecasts than economic forecasters do, who have that expertise. Right? They can do it just based on the information they get on the internet. We, in psychology, these people are called super forecasters. And it appears that what they have is just very, very good judgment. And, re, very, and they're very open-minded. They're really willing to change their minds. And over a period of years, they can actually outperform economic forecasters. They're just ordinary people who just have very, very good judgment and are very willing to update their opinions in, result, in response to new evidence. Right? We cannot forecast complex economic and financial systems. And that's why we keep getting these kind of crises. OK. Let's do another experiment. If you know this experiment, and you might, please don't shout out the answer. There's probably a few people in the room who do. Imagine in front of you, I've given you four cards. OK? So like playing cards, right? And they're just on the table in front of you. One of them has an A on it. One of them has a B on it. One of them has a 4 on it. And one of them has a 7 on it. OK, you've got four cards, A, B, four, seven. And you're being asked to test a rule. The rule you're being asked to test is the following. If there is a vowel on one side, there is an even number on the other side. OK, so you've got four cards, A, B, four, seven. The rule is, if there is a vowel on one side, there is an even number on the other side. My question to you is, to test that rule, which cards do you turn over? Yes, you can, you can turn over all four, but some of them you need to turn over and some of them you don't. So supposing the idea is you're trying to do it as efficiently as possible, you're just trying to turn over the ones you need to turn over. Just A, just a I've got as an answer. One letter and one number. One letter and one number, just A. 
Does anyone else want to have a go? B and seven. B and seven. Four. How many people think you've got to turn the A over? Let's have a show of hands. How many people think you have to turn the A over? Oh, people are getting too shy here. <laughs> My interaction is gone. Uh, how many people think you have to turn the B over? The four. Four, the seven. Okay, I'm going to make the claim that the A and the four were the most popular. That's the, that's the answer that you normally get. What people normally tell you that you've got to turn over is the A and the four. The A is completely correct. You do have to turn over the A. If there's a vowel on one side, there's an even number on the other. If you turn over the A and there's an odd number on the other side, the rule is wrong. So turning over the A tests the rule. But the problem is, and I say the problem, the finding is, this is a classic experiment that was done by a guy called Peter Wazen in the 1960s. What people typically do is they turn over the A and the four. Somewhere around 70, 80% of people will turn over the A and the four, uh, including people who have mathematics PhDs. The mistake is turning over the four. You don't need to turn over the four. If you think about it, it doesn't actually matter what's on the other side of the four. Right? I mean, if it, what's on the other side of the four is a vowel or a consonant, it doesn't violate the rule. The rule is if there's a vowel on one side, there's, a consonant, there's a, an even number on the other side. Right? That doesn't mean if there's an even number on one side, there has to be a vowel on the other side. Right? But people typically turn the four over. And the reason is what's called confirmation bias. What that means is if you have a belief that you're trying to test, if you have a principle or an idea that you're trying to test, human beings instinctively look for positive examples of the rule. So I say, if there's a vowel on one side, there's an even number on the other, and people turn over the vowel and the even number because they're looking to see if there's a vowel on the other side of the four and an even number on the other side of the, of the A. Now, you don't have to turn over the B either. The one you actually do have to turn over is the seven because if there's a vowel on the other side, it violates the rule. The two you have to turn over is the A and the seven. Less than 10% of people who've ever done this experiment get the answer right, even though afterwards everybody agrees that it's right when they think it through. Instinctively, intuitively, we don't get the answer right. And the reason is confirmation bias. We look for examples that confirm rules rather than examples that refute them. I'm going to argue that deep psychological problem is one of the causes of the financial crisis. When it came to the beliefs that people had, and you can see it actually in the writings of the central bank and the regulator, I've gone looking at them, back to the early noughties, what you find is that when there were views expressed that suggested there might be a problem, and there were some views that suggested there might be a problem, people went looking for evidence to support the status quo. They went looking for evidence that everything was okay. And sure, they found it, because if you went looking for it, you could. They didn't go looking for the troublesome evidence, which goes back to Morgan Kelly, because the troublesome evidence actually was quite easy to find if you went looking for troublesome evidence. But human beings generally don't. They generally look for confirmatory evidence of what they believe to support those beliefs. Let's do another experiment. How many people in the room are worse than average drivers? You're a very impressive audience, I have to say. I mean, obviously, obviously what we've just seen is not true, right? Because it is simply undeniably impossibly the case that only about eight or ten people in the room are worse than average drivers, right? It's got to be closer to about 40 or something, right? If you do this, generally speaking, the overwhelming majority of the population believe they're better than average drivers. 97% of the population think they have a better than average sense of humor. <laughs> Human beings, 80% of them, are systematically over-optimistic. We believe we're going to get better exam results than we do. We believe we're going to earn more money than we do. We believe our probability of catching chronic or unpleasant diseases is lower than it is. We believe that our relationships are going to be more successful than they turn out to be. We believe we are less likely to get divorced than we are. Systematically, about 80% of human beings are over-optimistic. That was the cause of the financial crisis. People who paid large amounts of money and took a bet on being able to repay those mortgages were betting on their future income, betting on their future health status, and betting on their future relationship status. Very many of them were wrong. Human beings are systematically over -optimistic, overly optimistic. It's one of the reasons why they stretch themselves too much financially on a routine basis, because they think they're going to end up being able to pay back more and have a more stable life and a more healthy life than actually they are. Um, there's an enormous body of evidence on that, actually. 
Uh, let's give you another choice. I'm going to give you a choice of two things. I want a show of hands. Please, last time I asked for a show of hands, didn't get very many. So this time, okay, I'm going to give you two choices. You've got to go one way or the other. Okay, so everyone's got to put their hands up for one of the two options. Right? If you don't, I can see who you are. <laughs> right. You can either have 1,000 euros today, now, or you can come back this time next week and have 1,050. So have a think about that. You can either have 1,000 in your hand right now, or you can come back next week and have 1,050. Now, who is going to take the 1,000 in your hand now? I have clearly not come across as very trustworthy in the last 45 minutes. <laughs> I'm particularly troubled by the fact that I won't point her out, but my partner just put her hand up. <laughs> um, <laughs> who's going to take the 1,050 in a week's time? Okay, it's split a slight majority for taking the 1,000. Right, for taking the 1,000 immediately. Okay, I'm going to ask the following question. You now have a choice between taking 1,000 euros on January, is it the 18th today? Yeah. On January the 18th, 2019, or 1,050 euros on January the 25th, 2019. Have a think about that. You can have 1,000 on the 18th next year, or you can have 1,050 on the 25th. Is anybody going to take the 1,000 on the 18th? Occasionally get a couple. Yeah, I mean, you might have Christmas debts to pay off. I could see, I could see, I could see a logic to it. Right? Something really bizarre has happened there when you think about it. Right? The cost of a one-week delay has just completely changed. It's completely changed for whether it's a difference between now and a week's time, or whether it's a week's delay in a year's time. You've just all, incidentally, by doing that, violated orthodox economics, which says that you should discount the future at a constant interest rate. I mean, you're actually violating all sorts of economics by turning around an interest rate of 5% a week. Uh, you can't get 5% a year at the moment anywhere in Ireland, but we'll draw a veil over that. But what that experiment shows, and it's been shown in multiple contexts, you can do it over days, you can do it over years, you can do it over decades, is that people price immediate time differently to how they price the equivalent amount of time in the future. It's a very strong human instinct, and animals have it too. That's the cause of the financial crisis. Why? Because people weight immediate rewards more than they weight the potential pains and costs that come down the road. They discount the future steeply. Right? If you want to understand why it is that people routinely financially overstretch themselves, they are overly optimistic. They value the immediate more than they value the future. Even perfectly reasonable, rational people, we almost all do it. Right? We'll take those immediate rewards and we'll value them more highly. Let's do one more experiment, and then I'll draw to a close. Supposing I offer you three choices. Okay, so imagine you've come into some money. Let's say it's a fairly substantial amount of money. Right? Maybe it's a bequest or so. You've come into a surprisingly quite substantial amount of money, and because you weren't planning for it, you think the sensible thing to do is to invest it, which would be the sensible thing to do. I'm going to give you three investment options. You can go for A, B, or C. OK? And again, I'd like to show hands, please. Um, please do one of the three. OK? Let's imagine it's quite a lot of money. Let's imagine it's 50,000 euros you've come into. OK? And you can do the following. Option A, you can invest that money in the shares of a basket of the 20 most successful Irish companies from the last 10 years. That's option A. So you put your 50,000 into shares of the 20 best-performing Irish companies of the last 20 years. Okay. And you invest it. Option B, you can invest your money in the 20 best-performing companies in the last 10 years in the European Union. Right. That means you've got to invest some of it in London, some of it in Frankfurt, some of it in Dublin, some of it wherever. But wherever you've got the best-performing companies, in Europe, we're going to invest in 20 of those instead. That's option B. Option C, you're going to invest in five of the best performing United States companies, five of the best performing European companies, five of the best performing Asian companies, and five of the best performing Austra Australasian companies. Let's assume that 
Because actually, these days, you can do that for almost exactly the same price as you can invest in your own domestic companies. So you can invest in five companies in each of four different continents. That's option C. So have a little bit of think about it. You've come into this money, and I want to know how you're going to invest it. OK, who is going to invest in option A? I've got a few. I've got about five. Who's going to invest in option B? And who's going to invest in option C? You are genuinely one of the most sophisticated audiences that I've ever spoken in front of. I've never yet had C be the highest, get the highest number of votes. Um, from a financial point of view, it is actually absolutely unarguable that C is the best option. Right? It, any financial theory or expertise at all will tell you that C is the best option. And the reason for that is hedging. The reason for that is because what you are doing is you are spreading risk across multiple uncorrelated markets, or actually they are correlated but not so correlated, whereas if you put all the money in Irish companies, the performance of companies are very highly correlated, and if you put it all into the European companies, the, it's not as highly correlated as the Irish companies, but it is still nevertheless correlated. Typically, if you do this, I mean, I'm doing this experiment hypothetically, if you actually look at real-world data, you find what's called the home investor bias. What's the home investor bias? The home investor bias is that people are far more willing to take risks with stuff they're familiar with and is closer to home. Well, sh sure. I mean, I guess, given how you've been primed for the previous 45 or 50 minutes or so, investing in the top Irish companies might not appear a sensible thing. Uh, indeed. Now, in the jargon, in my business, this is called ambiguity aversion, that people are much happier taking equivalent risks in areas that they feel more familiar with, where they feel they actually have a better understanding of the risk. You might feel you've got no idea about the performance of Asian companies or Australasian companies, and the fact that you know less about it makes you less willing to take a risk on it. And typically, this is what we find, and this is called ambiguity aversion. This is one of the causes of the financial crisis. We were massively disproportionately invested in Ireland, and we were massively disproportionately invested in property. Why? Because that's what's most familiar to people, and that's what they feel like they understand better, even though actually the financial risk involved was massively greater by doing it. I'm going to draw to a close, and what I hope I've done is two things. I hope I got a central message across to you that our financial systems, the financial systems that we have made in this world, are so complex that nobody understands them. Nobody understands them. And that that's the reason we keep touching the hot plate. Because we don't know it is a hot plate. Right? Now, there are many benefits from these, this financial operation that we have. We have more rich and developed countries than we have ever had. But there are also huge risks associated with it, and those risks come and they bite us regularly, routinely, and have done so ever since the Industrial Revolution. I'm arguing that they're going to continue to do so. The second thing I hope I've convinced you of is that there are some very deep-seated, underlying psychological phenomena that are highly relevant to the way people make decisions that make us more vulnerable to financial crises and financial problems in the way that we as individuals make decisions, regardless of how sophisticated and educated we are. We are all vulnerable because of the way as human beings we make decisions and because there are deep-seated psychological influences there that can be shown through fairly simple, straightforward, elegant experiments and surveys. And we are also vulnerable because we underestimate our own ignorance because we believe we understand things that we can talk about and see and monitor actually far better than we do. As human beings, we suffer from optimism and we suffer from hubris. I hope I've managed to persuade you of those things. If I have, then what is the punchline? The punchline for me is this, that we overstate our expertise, we understate the potential for extremes and the amount of risk that we have in our world, and if we really want to avoid touching that hot plate, actually, and as an educated liberal, it almost pains me to say this, we need to be more conservative. We need to know there are more hot plates there, and we need to respect them. The countries that suffered the least as a result of the global financial crisis are countries like Canada. 
Canada have one of the most conservative, traditional, unchanged banking regimes of any developed country, and one of the results of that was it withstood the financial crisis, despite being next door to one of the biggest sufferers, the United States, far better than almost all other developed countries. It simply wouldn't allow its banks to innovate and invest and trade to the degree and in the volumes that the other international banks were allowed to invest and innovate and trade in these complex financial securities. It just didn't let them do it. It banned it. It limited it. It said they had to have higher capital requirements. It said they could only invest very small amounts in them. In short, they were conservative. And as an educated liberal, what I'm ultimately going to tell you tonight is we are going to continue to suffer financial crises. I would be conservative in your own personal financial management. I would support conservatism when it comes to financial regulation. And I would even go a little bit further. I would even, and you may view this as contentious, and you may not, and there may be people who work in financial services in the room whose hackles are about to go up. I would argue even more that actually it is one of the most miserable aspects of our existence in modern developed economies that so many of our young, intelligent, innovative, educated, bright people go into selling financial products that are of little value. And on that thought, I'm very happy to answer questions and I will leave you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we've got a few microphones, so... Quick question on the, you know, valuing the... The time value of, of you know... Uh, basically, when you gave the experiment or the option of um, having 1,000 euro on the 18th of January 2018 versus the 20th, so I'm just wondering if there's a, an evolutionary reason that people value, uh, you know, the immediate uh, periods more than the, uh, let's say, more so in the future, just from a kind of survival evolutionary perspective, you know. Uh, the point you made is an extremely good one. Um, I need to be careful what I say for the following reason. What causes that finding is highly controversial. There are, roughly speaking, four separate theories at the moment that are competing for trying to explain why we discount the future the way we do. At least three of them involve something close to what you're saying, which is to say that, in a way, it's a response to the riskiness of our environment, that effectively what we're doing is it's a bird in the hand. You know, get it now because it might not be available in a week's time. It might not be available in a year's time. It might not be there. You know, and there are strong evolutionary reasons why, if you can avail of something now, grab it and hold it and run away. Right? And that's part of the story, absolutely, undoubtedly. It's very interesting that and I, I said this, but it's worth repeating. I mean, animal species, right down past small rodents, discount time the way we do. <laughs> um, so there has to be some kind of evolutionary basis to the way we do it. But like so many things about human evolution, what this is, is it's an instinct about how we make decisions that can make us unstuck if we are in a world that's a bit more stable. So if it's preventing me from taking out a pension when actually there's really quite a likelihood that I ultimately will get that pension and I will live to be 65 and beyond, then it causes a problem. So even though it's adapted to our environment really successfully, it's not adapted to a modern capitalist environment where we might make financial decisions. But, I, but all I'm really doing is agreeing with you. It's a very good point. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. That's such a, an interesting um, discussion tonight. My question is, what do you think is the role, if any, of artificial intelligence and the blockchain in what you've described tonight? So artificial intelligence being if the systems are too complex for humans to comprehend, do you see a role for sophisticated algorithms to make better decisions? And then with the blockchain technology, do you think that that offers an opportunity for more financial transparency in markets? That's a very good question, and I'm going to sit very squarely on the fence. Um, I now devolve more of my own financial decision-making to choice engines than I used to. What I mean by a choice engine is any piece of artificial intelligence that helps me make a decision. So I downloaded an app, I'll recommend it because I thought it was terrific, called Killbiller. Killbiller will tell you 
if you allow it to access your mobile phone records, which tariff in the market in Ireland would be the cheapest one for you to be on. By doing that, I saved myself the best part of 40 quid a month on my mobile bill. Right? That's a choice engine. Now, that piece of software, that algorithm, could do something that I couldn't. I'm a trained economist, but I couldn't have come up with the answer that a little app on my phone came up with. My phone can beat me at chess, too, which is a fairly depressing thought, but you know, this tiny little piece of kit can beat me at chess, and it can also choose better mobile packages for me. So I, I'm a strong advocator of using these kind of price comparison type tools and using algorithms to help you make better decisions, and the jargon for them is choice engines. The reason I'm sitting on the fence, though, is I think these things also get us into terrible trouble. One of the causes of the financial crisis was actually reliance on algorithms and artificial intelligence. So the pricing models and the algorithms that some of the lead financial institutions were using, they had far too much faith in. And they believed that their outputs insulated them against the kind of losses that they ultimately suffered. An algorithm is only as good as the understanding of the person who writes it. Somebody somewhere, if they do all their research and accesses the right data, genuinely can understand the Irish mobile market well enough to find the best tariff for me. I don't think anybody in the United States financial markets had the understanding and the wherewithal to know which of those financial assets was worth what. So if you place too much faith in them, they can get you into terrible trouble, but certainly if it's a problem that somebody somewhere understands and they can encapsulate that understanding in an algorithm, then the algorithm can be useful. Sorry, I am sitting on the fence there right now. Can, can I ask another question? That the illusion of explanatory depth is a, is a brilliant moniker for something. Given the truth of that, what, if any, faith can we put in economic forecasts? And how do we, how do we know? I mean, with the greatest of respect to your colleagues in the ESO. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> how do they respond to your insight about the illusion of explanatory death? And how can we recognize when they're making a legitimate forecast versus simply replicating the behavior of bookies at a race meeting? In answer to your question, how do they respond, um, I can only respond myself that uh, my, the esteem with which my colleagues have held me and my views has oscillated. Um, I mean, there were times when arguments within the Institute got very, very vociferous during the crisis, um, and I myself got myself into quite a lot of hot water by writing a paper suggesting some of the things that I've talked about tonight. Um, that paper was controversial enough that the main Irish economics journal refused to publish it, um, and I was delighted when the editor of Irish Political Science picked up the phone laughing and said, we'll publish it. Um, <laughs> and now some of the economists who at the time hated it even cite it, so we, we kind of got over that little issue. Um, I have consistently argued internally and sometimes in public, even though it's painful as a member of the SRI, that we overstate the value of economic forecasts. We place too much attention on them. We talk about them too much in the papers. We think they're more reliable than we are. We overstate their reliability. I've consistently argued that. I will keep arguing that because I think it's true and I think as a scientist it's my duty to say these things even if they're unpopular with some of my colleagues. But that said, where I meet my colleagues who work in this kind of stuff is you've got to have a forecast. I mean, you have to make decisions based on some kind of vision of the future. I mean, if you're trying to decide what level of public expenditure and how to spend it, you've got to have some kind of guess as to what's going to happen. The fact that we place too much weight on them and we think they're more accurate than they are doesn't mean they're not useful. It just means we're not using them properly. So what I would argue is it's fine to be forecasting, and the SRI should be forecasting, and I would actually argue that our forecasting operation is a lot more reliable than some other forecasting operations, particularly some that come out of the private sector. Right? However, I think as a society and in journalism and in business and generally, we underestimate the degree to which those forecasts are unreliable. We think they're better than they are, and we place too much prominence on them. Could I, could I ask you two things, really? We haven't really touched on morality, I don't think. And it's, it strikes me that a lot of, as many companies as possible, will get away with what they can push. They're pushing the barrier all the time, rather than having a moral culture within the company. And in reality, companies fear public embarrassment, and not just a financial thing, but most companies fear public embarrassment rather than anything else. 
and that the Joe Duffy show or the likes of these people has far more fear, at least in the short term, than regulators and regulation. So I just wonder about the absence of morality as okay. a background in, in that. I want to make two points to you, if I may. Um, one is to say that there's a degree to which I agree with you. So there is now a push. Um, I, I do some work with international regulators, and I know some of the people that, some of the academics that work in business regulation. There is now actually quite a strong push for a movement for more ethical regulation and ethical business practice. Uh, I think that's increased since the financial crisis. I think it's partly a response to it, but I think it's also partly a genuine understanding on behalf of some people that it's essential, that saying it's okay for businesses to only care about the bottom line simply won't wash anymore, that that's an economic ideology that is now outdated and we know more than that, and that we have to expect more of private companies, that it isn't just the bottom line, that there are higher principles they have to uphold. So to that extent, I agree with you, and you can see that movement happening. Whether it is ultimately going to make any significant change on commercial behavior and certain commercial practices, and I'm thinking particularly there of circumstances where there are organizations that sell financial products that are not good for the people that are buying them, where the organization know that they're not good for the people who are buying them, but are making money and do it anyway. Right? But also, I, it has yeah. to be mentioned, the American government recently rolled back a regulation didn't, where, where advisors were required that that would be a priority, that it would be in their best interest. So even at government level, at a Think they're attacking this type of... Yes, I, 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 I agree with you. I, I absolutely agree with you. I, th I think you're right. Um, however, I want to make another point. I quite often, and I'm not suggesting you're saying this, but it's a point I really want to make in response to your question. You quite often, and I've given many talks about the cause of the financial crisis and trying to understand from different people what they think went on and get some kind of understanding, you quite often come across a view that the fundamental cause of the financial crisis was some kind of immoral or unreasonable behavior, some kind of unprofessional or immoral behavior on part, part of a subset of society, whether it's politicians, whether it's um, developers, whether it's bankers, whether it's regulators, whatever it happens to be. You quite often come across this idea that the crisis and our woes were caused by the immoral behavior of some subset. Now, I'm not going to deny there was immoral behavior. I mean, you've only got to listen to the Anglo tapes. I mean, it's absolutely horrific, right? I mean, they're great fun to listen to, provided you're of a stern enough composition that you can cope, right? But it's pretty horrible what they're saying, okay? I mean, there was immoral behavior, but I think it's really important to understand that actually that wasn't a fundamental cause of the crisis. That we're going to have those crises regardless of immoral behavior. Why? Because we take poor decisions in the face of things that we don't understand, so that even people who are trying to behave in a principled and ethical way come a cropper when it comes to finance. So I think you know, immoral behavior clearly is a contributing factor, and it's an important thing. And I think the point you've made about ethical business practice and ethical business regulation is an extremely important one. But I don't think it's a fundamental cause. I think the fundamental causes are deeper psychologically than that. Well, what I was going to say is, uh, we're going to just quickly wrap it, but I think Pete is going to stay around if I can convince him, convince him for five minutes before he gets I, I will. That, his kids. That, that clock says 1949. I will stay until it says 20. Yeah. <laughs> uh, folks, I'd like to um, thank Pete for joining us this evening uh, and for you guys for staying. Um, through the, the last, I think it's been about eight weeks of uh, lectures, uh, we've looked at all the factors that could doom humanity and uh, what humans or what actions uh, that humans take that could trigger the end of the world. And I think this evening's lecture has been really eye opening, but as well, it has given us 24 reasons. Is it 24? <laughs> um, but I think. Uh, something for those of you who've been to all the lectures or some of them, um, it's not one thing that's going to cause the world. I think it's a, a combination. Um, 
Um, we just have to forecast it and try and not be too optimistic. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, we're we're going to wrap it and uh, we're going to invite everyone uh, who's here this evening to join us uh, for a small reception. Uh, for those of you who book tickets um, in sixes or fours uh, as part of a bundle, uh, we have a little uh, tote bag for you guys. And Pete is going to be here for another seven minutes if you want to ask a question. <laughs> uh, I'd love to give everyone a round of applause and Pete. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to leave you to your <laughs> That's fine. Yeah.